All righty, we have got now time to get into the Sunday School lesson. We are continuing in the book of Acts. We are going to be studying in Acts chapter 7. Uh, Hannah, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, shout out to you. Um, hope that this is beneficial. Acts chapter 7, verses 45 through 60. We're in the climactic stage of the Acts chapter 7 that we've been covering now for a few weeks. We've actually, we're now actually going to be finishing up with Stephen's speech, part four of Stephen's speech, and that's going to lead right to the part where he is stoned to death. And um, what we have here is the uh, statements that Stephen's going to be making, and he's going to be basically making this uh, accusation of the very people there that were putting him on trial, who had arrested him. They, he was arrested on false pretenses. He was put into custody, and now he has to make a statement um, that essentially he never really addressed the charge of his uh, violation that he had made about speaking against the temple. And that was way back in Acts chapter 6, verse 13. But we're going to look at this now, the climactic portion of this, and make some insights as we go. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look to the Lord with a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, we are just thankful to be here today, to be able to just sit quietly now and hear you speak to us. And Lord, I pray that the words that are being used here are not words, any special words that I have, but totally the words that you have through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we can get together and go over your word and just kind of sit and meditate on it and recognize your goodness as you teach us. Thank you, Lord. We ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, everybody, turn your Bibles and electronic devices to Acts chapter 7. Let's look at verses 45 through 60. This passage... I mentioned earlier it was the climax uh, of the uh, basically the speech that Stephen is giving. We broke it up into four parts because it was a long speech. <laughs> it was a long opportunity for testimony. But I want to read now verses 45 through 60 and take you through the end here. Remember what I had mentioned before when we look at this too is look at the audience that uh, Stephen is speaking to. He's speaking to those who are accusers of him. And I'm just going to even go out there, and it's not really a stretch to say this, but Satan has been in furious opposition to the way, the movement of the church. This is early in the church's existence, and he is doing everything he can to damage or hurt or even have caused people to be killed um, because of the statement about Jesus and how People have been ignoring the truth, ignoring what's been right in front of them. So for what it's worth, let's start reading verses 45 through 60, reading from the New Living Translation, and then we'll go back over the passage and comment on it as we go. So let's start verse 45, Acts chapter 7, verse 45. And this is Stephen speaking. We're just picking up with the speech. Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nations that God drove out of this land... The tabernacle was taken with them into their new territory, and it stayed there until the time of King David. Verse 46, David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. However, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that, asked the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? You stubborn people, verse 51, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. Verse 54, the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. 
and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the, sun, they see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60, he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. All right, that's Acts chapter 7, verses 45 through 60. And by the way, we don't need to feel sorry for Stephen. <laughs> Stephen is in glory. He is exactly where uh, he was going to be. He was called by God to give this speech. And I believe, um, I don't think there's anything to dispute this. This was the speech of his life that he gave before a bunch of people making a huge testimony about God's goodness and how these people were, frankly, uh, acting in a manner that was just refusing to acknowledge the goodness of God, refusing to acknowledge God. They would much rather do what they were doing, practicing their own religion, practicing their own way of seeing things. These are the Sadducees. These are the people who were in authority at the time, the very ones who did not believe in a resurrection. So we're, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this because... Satan has been very, very active throughout history, especially since Jesus went to the cross and then rose again and essentially defeated uh, Satan's purposes. So what's Satan going to be doing from here on out? He is going to try to distract. He's going to try to destroy. He's going to try to make sure that a lot of people, and let's even add to that a lot of people living today, distracted from following Jesus. There's all kinds of things that people experience um, that keep them away from Jesus Christ. We have people who know what's right and know how to go about it, but for whatever reason, there's this roadblock that Satan has put in their lives. And some of it is as simple as pridefulness, not wanting to pray, not wanting to seek the Lord, maybe even not wanting to seek the Lord because they're afraid of the answer. But we all need to understand what Scripture says. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We don't, none of us have, uh, get a pass on that. We have to acknowledge we need a Savior. And Satan is going to try to continue to distract and keep people away from the Lord. Let's go back to the top of the passage Acts chapter 7, um, uh, verse 45. Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nations that God drove out of this land, the tabernacle was taken with them into their new territory, and it stayed there until the time of King David. And recognize that this was when Moses was uh, handing off uh, the uh, ministry of the Israelites and the leadership of the Israelites to Joshua. And Joshua was the one who carried it on and we're going now, Stephen is giving us word that it's being carried through until the time of David. And verse 46, David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. And we have to recognize that um, there was a temple that was built because this was the way for us as human beings to appreciate or find a place to go and worship the Lord a place where they could go and stand before the Lord or stand or stand before the priests, I should say. And of course, before the Lord too, but stand before the priests and recognize that the Lord is worthy of worship and praise. But we need to understand something about this temple. And as we'll get to that further on in the passage here, it's great to have a place to worship God, but God has made it very simple from the standpoint that when he... Uh, sent the Holy Spirit when Jesus Christ said this, here comes the Spirit. The Spirit's going to be coming for us. Well, God wants to be within us. We can certainly go and worship Him in a church, but God wants to reside within us. That's because He loves us. 
And that's because he knows that we need the spirit within us to do what? Battle against Satan. He knows that we need this very thing. We need his very presence to battle against Satan. The message today at church, here in the church is going to be about dealing with temptation. Temptation is something that happens all the time. We're tempted to part from God and go our own way and live selfishly and do things. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us to fight against Satan. People who have made their minds up like these same Sadducees did, these people who are being spoken about when Stephen is giving them an accusation, uh, they've made up their minds already where they want to go. They do not want to follow the Holy Spirit. They do not want to follow God. They'd much rather do what they're doing. And it's interesting how anybody who is opposed to the way, anybody who was opposed to doing things the old way, the old Mosaic law, I'm saying that backwards. Anyone who is not following the Mosaic law, the old way of doing things, they're the ones being accused of departing from the faith. When in actuality, the ones who are standing on this old Mosaic law, they have to understand they're condemned under the old law anyway. The old law condemns them because of their very nature. They don't realize that because Satan has blinded them of that. And we need to understand that Stephen is using powerful words to make a statement about how he has a fixed mind, a fixed heart. He's going to keep going because the Spirit is giving him the words to speak. Do we live that way? I want you to turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, and we're going to look at verses 7 through 9. Psalm 57, verses 7 through 9. What we as believers need to recognize when we're in the face of opposition, and we're in the face of opposition because we're in Satan's domain. This was very accurately stated even by Satan in Matthew chapter 4 when he was talking to Jesus, trying to, you know, tempt him further. He literally could say that all the kingdoms of the earth fall under him. But we are in, we are playing on Satan's turf, to use some sports analogies. We're like the visiting team. We're only here for a moment, but we can still win if we act like we're winning and play like we're winning. And we have to have what it says here in verse 50, uh, chapter 57, Psalm 57, excuse me, verses 7 through 9. My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, my soul, wake up, O harp and lyre. I will waken the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, in front of all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. And one other passage to look at. Turn over to Psalm 108. Psalm 108. Psalm 108, verse 1. Psalm 108, verse 1. My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, my soul. Hezekiah Walker has a song that some of you may be familiar with back in 2008. I think it came up with a song called Sold Out. Sold, S-O-U-L-E-D, out. Sold out. I'm not going to play it because if I play a song, it's going to kick us off the <laughs> kick us off the internet. But I'll have you go look it up. But among the lyrics of that song, is my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. My mind's made up. And that is exactly, and he is saying because he's sold out. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit, the soul. His soul is now 
joined in with the Holy Spirit. And that's how he's living his life. And so that means that he is going to make a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter where he goes or where he sings or whatever it is. That's essentially how we have to live today. And that's what Stephen was doing here. Stephen knew he was going to die. We don't have necessarily the concern about what our lives will face if we make a public testimony about Jesus Christ. But I guarantee you Stephen knew he was going to die. When you give a speech like this and you're making a presentation like this, he indeed knew where he was going to be. And God even gave him the glimpse, gave him the glimpse of this by what we leave, look at later on in the passage about seeing the, the image, the, the place of Jesus Christ standing right next to the Father. He indeed is looking for that. He is looking forward to that. He knows that's what's coming. We need to have the same type of zeal for Christ, speaking up for Jesus, not allowing for the Satan, Satans or the Satans of this world, the ones who are uh, following Satan to detract us from that goal. We're already in an age that we live in where there are fewer and fewer people coming to church. Amen? There are fewer and fewer people coming to church. There are fewer and fewer people that are coming to church to hear the truth. And that doesn't include some churches that don't even talk about the truth. We have to be convicted to speak about Jesus Christ and speak about the truth of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the passage. I'll start, I started reading again verse 46. I want to get further along than where I'm at right now. <laughs> David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a ter permanent temple for the God of Jacob, but it was Solomon who actually built it. And we recognize that. We understand why, because David was a man of war. He was not going to be the one to build this temple. And understand that God is allowing this temple to be built. He's allowing it to take place. And we understand that and get that. Verse 48, however, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands. He's making a statement here. And this partially answers the question of why Stephen was being accused of speaking against the temple. He's saying this because God does not live in this building, in a temple building. It's a place of worship, but it doesn't mean that God is living there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He can't be in just one location like that. He's omnipresent. And I want you to follow now what he's saying. And again, the audience, the people who oppose Stephen, he's the one he's addressing this to. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. That's verse 49. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Asked the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place? And that's what we need to see here. Did my hands make both heaven and earth? Take a look at Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, the last chapter of Isaiah. How about that? Isaiah 66, I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. Now, remember, this information was available, too, for all of the Sadducees, those people who are, are hearing this testimony that Stephen is making. This is here in Isaiah. It's an Old Testament statement. Isaiah 66, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you ever build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me a could you build a dwelling place for me? Verse 2. My hands have been made have made both heaven and earth and they are mine. I the Lord have spoken. 
one thing I need to learn, get a Bible that has larger print, so I'm not straining to read it. But he's saying he goes beyond just the building of a temple, a building. He resides in heaven. That's his place of residence. That's where he calls himself, his own home. That's his home that we are looking forward to going to. But he's not confined to a building. So he's making the statement that you're neglecting, Sadducees, what Isaiah said in Isaiah about, am I confined to a building? You're talking about desecrating a temple or, or not being obedient. You're, you're making a statement that doesn't need to be made. It's not applicable to anything. But you have to understand, that's how Satan deceives people. Satan is a liar and the father of liars. He will lie, lie, lie. Why do we listen to Satan? Why do we listen to Satan? The reason why we sometimes listen to Satan, in all honesty, is because of our pride. And it's because we choose to do things differently. When God tells us what's good for us, we choose to go, well, there must be something better. Eve deceived, Eve was deceived by Satan to think that there was something better out there. That's why she took the fruit. We need to understand how Satan operates. And all he wants to do is cause confusion and have people all stirred up and go against Jesus Christ. And he does that actively today. So when you look at people who are really scuffling and they're scuffling in their lives, you've got to understand something. Satan is dumping everything that he has on them to keep them away from the family of God. And you, of the people of, the, of faith, need to be praying that God continues to help you through these times that we live in. You need to take care of yourself and ownership over what you do because he is throwing everything and the kitchen sink at folks today. Got real quiet in here. Everybody thinking about that, huh? <laughs> and understand that the times that Stephen is living in and all the other prophets, they were these prophets were all killed. Let's go to verse 50. Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? That's the Lord speaking. You stubborn people. Here we go. Verse 51. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? Stephen is calling them out and telling them about who they are. They are resisting the Holy Spirit. That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. And why is he saying that? He's saying that because, look verse 52. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. There were many prophets who were persecuted and killed. And we read scripture and, you know, look, the Bible is, is a Bible about truth. It's not about all about happy stuff. Bad stuff happens in scripture. And if you're looking for the Bible to uplift you, yeah, look to Jesus Christ. He's the reason why we need to be uplifted. Look to him because he's the focus. But at the end of the day, look at what, what Satan has been doing all throughout history to basically elevate himself to be a God like God the Father. Remember, what did he want? What got him kicked out of heaven in the first place? He wanted to be like God. So he's doing it in the way that fits his nature. And he wants to harm those and harm those that are following God, preaching God's word. He wants to be the one to, to take, you know, allow the people who are following him, resisting the Holy Spirit, to carry out his will. Carry out his will. Many prophets were persecuted and killed. Uriah, in Jeremiah 26, verses 20 to 23, Jeremiah was. Jeremiah 38, verses 1 to 6, Jeremiah was dumped into a cistern. 
had to be rescued because they were going to kill him. Isaiah, tradition says he was killed by King Manasseh, who was one of the most evil kings who ever lived. That's in 2 Kings 21.16. We believe that Manasseh probably was the one who carried out the order to have Isaiah killed as well, too. Amos was persecuted. He writes that in Amos chapter 7, verses 10 to 13. Elijah was persecuted. Jezebel wanted Elijah wiped out. And one thing we also have to be sensitive to, and I'm not trying to digress here, but these prophets, these people that God had sent to proclaim, they had the ultimate highs in their proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming the Lord to God to follow God and the coming of the Messiah. But they also had the greatest lows because they were depressed. They had to, they had to scuffle through that. Because they knew they were being chased. They knew they were being attacked. When we talk about people who go through depression, be sensitive to that. Be sensitive to those people. Because it's very easy and very simple to see how it can happen to anybody. And Jesus gave a parable. I, we don't have time to cover it. I want you to use this as homework. Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19. He gave a parable about how the Jews had constantly rejected God's messages, constantly refused God's messages and persecuted the messengers. That's Luke 20, verses 9 to 19. We don't have the time to cover that today. But I want you to see Jesus is speaking about this persecution. And of course, Jesus was persecuted. We don't need to be asking any more questions about how come I'm going through all this persecution? Well, you ought to be glad you're going through persecution. Because at the end of the day, that persecution means that you're on the right path. You're doing what God is calling you to do. And it's being recognized by Satan. And so you're going to face persecution. Doesn't mean you have to like it. It's not about liking it but don't complain about it. If you're not being persecuted and you say you're a believer, then now I got questions for you. Now I got questions for you. You don't think you're persecuted? How come? What's actually going on? Let's go back to the passage, Acts chapter 7, verse 53. You deliberately disobey God's law even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. They shook their fists at him in rage. Can you imagine the audience? They knew right then and there that Stephen was accusing them of the very things that they had done and their ancestors had done and the very thing they had done with Jesus Christ. They were the ones that were responsible or somewhat responsible. They were still there too. Remember, this is not long after Jesus was, went to the cross. These people are still alive during this time. They recognize what's going on here. You deliberately disobeyed God's law even though you received it from the hands of angels. Deliberately. Now, there's one thing about doing something unknowingly and there's another thing to do it deliberately. You can give someone a pass for being naive about the way of the Lord or the ways of Jesus, but only for a certain period of time. Because the, thing, the answer you always have is get in the Word and study the Word and read more about Jesus and let the Spirit speak to you and pray about what you've read. If you're not doing that, then that's where you're going to have a problem. Deliberately disobey God's law. So these people were supposedly well known, well had a lot of knowledge about the law. They were well aware of the law. They were well aware of the word. They knew who Isaiah was. But they deliberately 
disobeyed. They deliberately went against what was being given to them. They deliberately denied the truth about God and now the truth about Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. Now, that's the plight that we have today with Israel, some of the Israelites. They don't believe Jesus has come the first time. And it's not meant to be an accusation. It's more or less stating truth. That's exactly what it is. They're, they don't believe that Jesus has come the first time. God has to reveal to them the truth. It has to be revealed to them. And some of them aren't going to get it. And some of them have to go through the tribulation, which will be the greatest revival time in the history of the world. The tribulation when people are suffering. That will be a revival, a time of revival unlike any other time on earth. And I'm, I'm not sad to say I, won't, I don't want to be there with that. I'd rather, much rather be, <laughs> I don't want to be there. Um, and I don't have to be there because God's word says those who are followers of Jesus Christ, we're not under condemnation. We are not to be condemned. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? Verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And you have to understand that this is a way that Stephen is being rewarded for giving such a wonderful speech. You have to understand the Spirit led him to say all these things. He knows exactly what he's dealing with. But now he has this extra vision that he's going to relay to the people there in front of him. And of course, they're not going to want to hear that. But that's what he did. He saw the glory of God. Saw the glory of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And this was very similar to what Jesus said before the high council. Turn to Matthew 26. I have to watch my time. I'm good. Matthew 26. Matthew is a good study, too. We may have to get into Matthew uh, for one of our live stream Sunday school broadcasts. I think we're, we were circling back around to know what to teach next and Matthew may be uh, next on the list or close to that anyway. Matthew 26, verse 64. My lovely bride is waiting for the passage. I'm so sorry. Matthew 26, 64. Verse 64. Matthew 27. That's the wrong place. Verse 64, Jesus replied, Yes, it is as you say, and in the future you will see me, the Son of Man, sitting at God's right hand, in the place of power and coming back on the clouds of heaven. So he's making the same statement and testimony about what he is going to do in the future, what he is going to carry out. He is making it very clear that he is the Messiah, and Stephen is merely following suit with that same testimony uh, on his own. And, of course, Stephen's vision is what got him condemned and dragged out of the temple. Verse 56, he, said, he told him, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They had to get him out of the city, get him out of the temple, because they did not want to be accused of desecrating the temple either. And they wanted him out of the city, out in the outskirts. What happened, what happened with Jesus when he went to the cross? He was taken out of the city. He was taken to a place where he was not going to be condemned in the city. They didn't want to have anything to do with that. His accusers 
took, him, took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. We have an introduction now to Saul. Saul, just as a prelude to what we learn about Saul, who will be renamed Paul, Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is going to be his new name because he's going to be the one who is going to reach the Gentiles. But look at what God is doing. He's using a man who is now accused of being the one who condemned and said it was okay to murder Stephen and was very zealous for the faith, the, the old way, not the new way, but the old way. Verse 59, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin, and with that he died. So they're accusing Stephen of blasphemy. Okay. And they were following, you know, they were very conveniently following portions of the law to make sure that they were executing it properly. Leviticus 24, I'm not going to, uh, verse 14, I'm going to go back to that one real quick. I'm going to use something where I can actually read it. Leviticus 24, verse 14. This is the NIV version. Leviticus 24, 14. I'll wait till you get there. Understand that, um, I'm going to mention this later on in the message today too, but Satan knows scripture too. Um, he sure does. Take the blasphemer outside the camp. All those who heard him are to lay their hands on his head and the entire assembly is to stone him. And I'll add verse 15. Say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them. Whether foreigner or native born, when they blaspheme the name, they are to be put to death. And these religious leaders. Now, the thing that they didn't do, Stephen never got a trial. Notice that? Same way that Jesus never got a trial. They, they, were, they, went, they bypassed what they were supposed to do properly. And they just went ahead and stoned him. They went ahead and hung Jesus on a cross. And they didn't want to understand truth because they weren't going to be following truth. They were going to do what they felt, felt was right, what they felt was appropriate. They weren't seeking the truth. They only wanted people to pay attention to them, follow them, have them do what they wanted to do to have control over those individuals. But they weren't following God. And when Stephen passed away, when he died, he spoke the words very similar to the words that Jesus said on the cross. What words were those? Go to Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 34. Luke 23, 34. Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and they didn't know what they were doing. We can make an argument saying, yeah, they knew what they were doing. No, but they didn't really know. They didn't know what they were doing because Satan has deluded them so much that they were living in that delusion, thinking that they were doing what they wanted to do. They were doing what was right in their minds. And we have to understand something that um, death was the ultimate penalty that the price that wasn't the penalty, it was a price that Stephen pay, was paying, but it was all about how Christ was his redeemer. And sometimes when we speak truth about who Jesus is, 
when Stephen spoke about the truth of Jesus Christ, it exposes the sinful nature of others. And when we speak about the truth of Jesus Christ, it should lay bare the sinful nature of others, of other people who hear it. There should be a conviction taking place. And sometimes people are going to be hardened in their response as well, too. They will do all this to you because of me, for they rejected the one who sent me. That's in John 15, 21. Yeah, they're rejecting it. We shouldn't be surprised when we see persecution take place. Because Satan is vehemently opposed to the way, the truth, the life of Jesus Christ. So we'll look at the aftermath of this when we continue in Acts. But we need to see, if you don't get anything else out of today's Sunday school class, you need to be praying actively all the time as you read and study God's word for strength. For strength. Because you need strength. You need the Holy Spirit to strengthen you through this time we're living in. This time we're living in is really not much different than the time when Stephen was alive. It's still a time of persecution. There are people being persecuted. We as a nation have escaped a lot of that persecution. We haven't had to deal with persecution the way other people have dealt with it in different nations. But that time is coming. That time is approaching fast. And remember that nothing has to happen before the return of Jesus on the rapture. It can happen any time. All the more reason we need to be girded up and ready to speak about the truth of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear it. And praying for those people we know who don't know Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Bless this time, Lord, that we spent in your word. Lord, we thank you for the reminders that you indeed are worthy of our praise because of what you did for us on the cross for us. Nothing that we did, but everything that you did. We thank you, Lord, for that reminder. Lord, help us to be strengthened as we go forth and speak about your truth. We thank you for the lesson that we learn even from Stephen, knowing that he was going to face death, knowing that he was going to face persecution, stoning. Yet he spoke boldly for you and spoke the truth for you. We thank you for that reminder. Lord, strengthen us as well, too. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We appreciate you joining me today for this live stream at Sunday School for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio. Thank you so much for being here. Stay tuned online in about 20 minutes, give or take, for our live broadcast here at church. The message today um, lead us not into temptation. Take care of yourselves. God bless you. And we will see you around the corner. See you next time.